This time, we met Professor Laurent Pesch, who is the head of the Department of Law at the Middlesex University London, a specialist in EU public law and a highly established scholar. We are very glad to, to be with you here, Laurent. How are you doing? It's a pleasure uh, being with you. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can have uh, we can do this uh, in person uh, next year in Riga, uh, where I used to work at least uh, for a couple of months in 2003-2004 before a new country became a, a member of the EU. Perhaps you can tell more about that experience. I think that would be also a great segue for our listeners to understand your, uh, your, uh, your impact on Latvia. So essentially, I was lucky enough um, when I was doing my PhD in law, uh, I was uh, my first job, uh, which uh, got, uh, which helped me actually finance my PhD studies, was to work as a lawyer in Bosnia. Uh, and uh, after working in Bosnia, after gaining a lot of experience working for an international organization and then the Constitutional Court of Bosnia, I started getting consultancy contracts uh, uh, through uh, EU paid. Uh, programs and uh, one of the contracts I got uh, sent me to uh, Riga uh, for a few months uh, where I was essentially seconded to the Latvian Ministry of Finance. Uh, my job was to help with the drafting of uh, regulations to be used uh, to uh, oversee the spending of EU uh, structural uh, funds. So it was kind of a, to help with the incoming uh, flow of, of uh, EU funds and to make sure that uh, the EU acquis uh, was complied with. It was a very interesting experience. So I was based in the Ministry of Finance and uh, it was just uh, quite interesting to be there. And, you know, just before, uh, it was very exciting uh, in those days. Everyone was really happy, looking forward to uh, joining the EU. So I was glad uh, I saw that uh, with my own eyes. Would you say that the same enthusiasm is also visible today? Uh, regarding EU? <laughs> um, I guess uh, possibly not. I mean, in those days, we were talking not simply by one country joining the uh, EU, uh, but uh, several countries. And uh, in those days, we didn't face uh, the serious problems we're facing today, uh, one of which has been the subject of my scholarship, uh, rule of law backsliding. In 2003, 2004, when I was working in Latvia, I never really assumed that, uh, you know, one of your uh, close neighbors, uh, Poland, uh, would be going through what I have described as rule of law backsliding, but really meaning uh, now we're talking about rule of law breakdown. So no, I'm afraid uh, the optimism uh, I saw uh, in 2003 or in the early 2000s um, is nowhere to be seen uh, in 2021. Not quite the same, but a different time uh, with uh, much more pressing challenges and uh, problems. Which path uh, led you to Riga? How did you decide that you're going to spend the next few months here? Um, was it like a coincidence or it was planned but, uh, that you from Bosnia will eventually uh, go to Latvia? Uh, no, it was a pure chance, actually. Um, uh, the real story, so normally I, I get most of my consultancy and contracts through uh, by just making my CV available in uh, relevant databases. But in this case, it was not actually uh, through the normal uh, uh, manner, so to speak. Um, I was a PhD student, but also a, a PhD, uh, so as part of my PhD uh, study, sorry, um, I was teaching uh, uh, in, uh, in France and my institution had the partnership with the French embassy in Riga, uh, and the French embassy was looking for someone to teach uh, Latvian uh, law students. So it was uh, at the Latvian, uh, possibly uh, at your school. Uh, I gave uh, a few classes, and then I met someone who was looking for an expert on EU law to help with this uh, specific project. So I sent my CV, and then I was recruited. So really, by, it was just through uh, uh, several guest lectures uh, given uh, to uh, Latvian law students, and uh, these lectures were all uh, co-organized by the French embassy then. Uh, it was just by pure chance. Otherwise, uh, I, had, uh, I was lucky enough also to do uh, this kind of uh, contracts or consultancy uh, uh, missions uh, in uh, Romania, uh, Bulgaria. Um, uh, I also did uh, a lot of work in the Balkans, so uh, as I said, Bosnia, but also Montenegro. 
uh, and then I'm forgetting a few countries, um, but uh, it was uh, quite interesting. But my contract in Latvia was by far the longest because we're talking about a few months. Usually, uh, it's no, usually it's just uh, two to four weeks uh, most of the times. So you mentioned that your uh, your PhD topic was about backsliding of uh, no, uh, it was just uh, what I was doing. Uh, uh, what I was doing my PhD, I was sent uh, to Riga. But uh, no, in those days, I was work. Yes, I was working actually on rule of law uh, issues, but uh, mostly uh, boring uh, technical issues like uh, legal standing, access to justice, but nothing as dramatic as uh, what I have described as rule of law backsliding. Uh, rule of law backsliding didn't really start in the EU, at least, uh, before 2010-11 in Hungary. So this is quite new. Uh, I did uh, my PhD uh, between 1999 and 2004. So in those days, uh, the rule of law was actually uh, not very trendy. In fact, uh, uh, it was mostly, I was mostly then interested in technical issues and also conceptual issues. So what is the rule of law? Uh, what does it matter? But uh, from a purely conceptual point of view, and then uh, very basic questions about uh, uh, the access to the EU European Court of Justice or access to the European Court of Human Rights. You know, what kind of technical uh, improvements uh, can be made? Nothing as really fundamental as what we are discussing uh, in 2021, for instance, in relation to uh, Poland and Hungary, for instance. I actually been wondering uh, if we have touched upon the rule of law as your specialty, then I've been wondering about the fact that EU has always stated that they have non-negotiable uh, EU fundamental values, right? And then we see these two autocratic states Poland and Hungary that somehow violate them. And then on the paper, if it says non-negotiable, we see that EU is making compromises. And um, we, of course, democracy is about compromises, but I've been wondering where is the line that can be crossed um, for the for the great uh, for the greater good to solve the problem, but I, then again, whether it truly solves the problem or it makes it even larger, that you put a line which says not not further. And I, I wanted to ask you, how do you see this? Where is the line where the EU fundamental values are non-negotiable um, and where it can be compromised? So yes, so it's uh, you're raising plenty of uh, very interesting issues, but also very difficult to address them uh, in uh, on block very quickly. But uh, to begin with, I would say that uh, there is a core meaning of the rule of law in EU law, and uh, it has been made uh, very clear in the so-called rule of law conditionality regulation adopted last December. So if you look at the regulation, you're going to find uh, the core components of the rule of law uh, described uh, detail, in details in the regulation. So you could argue uh, these are the core principles you cannot uh, uh, violate. So that's we know at least uh, very clearly what are the core components of the rule of law. Uh, in addition, possibly of interest is uh, the principle of non-regression in EU law. Uh, which the Court of Justice has recently uh, essentially made clear applies to the rule of law in the so-called, uh, I mean, what I have called uh, the Romanian uh, judges one judgment. So, uh, no, sorry, the, the Maltese judge, uh, judgment. I'm uh, getting lost in my own uh, case law. Um, so in the Maltese judges uh, ruling, uh, for the first time, the Court of Justice has made clear that non-regression also applies to judicial independence. So once you join the EU, technically, as a matter of EU law, you cannot undermine the guarantees you have in place for judicial independence. So when it comes to judicial appointments, uh, when it comes to um, uh, access to uh, an independent tribunal, so the problem is not uh, that we lack uh, definition or that we don't have a core minimum components of the rule of law. Uh, the problem is enforcement uh, when these core components of the rule of law are violated. So uh, that's what you meant essentially by compromises. So technically, yes, uh, you're right. The EU institutions have always said, uh, and most recently the current president of the European Commission, that they, we should not compromise when it comes to the fundamental values uh, uh, on which the EU is based, uh, the rule of law being one of these uh, values. 
Now, sometimes it's not, uh, it can be arguable whether there is a violation of the rule of law or not. But in the case of Poland, for instance, uh, we are talking about the industrial scale uh, openly, uh, I mean, open violation of judicial independence. So there is no debate uh, that judicial independence is violated in a systemic uh, manner, which is why Article 7 of the TEU was actually triggered. So we're talking about a systemic uh, undermining of judicial independence. Now, has the EU compromised with Poland in this respect? I don't think so. Uh, what I've been criticizing is the lack of prompt enforcement. But the EU institutions have never said, listen, you've been violating judicial independence for so long that we're going to just forget about it. That's not what the EU has done. The EU has done many things, possibly not the right things and not quickly enough. So for instance, uh, in my scholarship or in my writings, I have criticized the use of dialogue-based processes when faced with a systemic violation of judicial independence. For me, when you are faced with the deliberate sustained uh, violation or attacks on judges and courts, you should step away from dialogue and you should enforce uh, the, uh, the law, uh, EU law requirements through uh, legal actions and financial sanctions. We're moving towards uh, this uh, direction anyway, because now uh, in the case of Poland, uh, we're talking about six years of attacks on uh, the core components of the rule of law. So um, enough is enough. And essentially uh, the EU has not compromised, but possibly the EU has tolerated rather uh, open violations of a structural nature regarding the rule of law. So in your opinion, uh, the answer to the problems uh, regarding judicial independence is not having a dialogue based means of solving uh, this, but more of compliance and rule based and penalty based uh, means uh, from Europe's side, right? Enforcement is key. Uh, dialogue only works if you're dealing with uh, good faith actors. Uh, but here in the case of Hungary, uh, the current authorities in Hungary and Poland, they are not, uh, we have a pattern of bad faith. So I'm not talking about one instance of bad faith. We have repeated instances of bad faith. Uh, so the principle of loyal cooperation, which is another EU law principle, has been repeatedly violated by Polish authorities when it comes to judicial independence. This is why dialogue uh, makes no sense in this particular constellation. Dialogue only works if you're dealing with good faith actors uh, keen on complying with their legal obligations. In this case, we are talking about national authorities, which are not, not simply violating EU law requirements, but also their own constitution. So to make it worse, it's not simply, you know, the EU rule of law, which is being undermined. In the case of Poland, this is the Polish rule of law itself as a matter of Polish constitutional law, which is being violated. Uh, in my view, uh, just to put it informally, uh, dialoguing with criminals has never prevented them from stopping to commit crimes. So it's just a waste of time if you want to know what I think about uh, this particular situation. And even if you don't agree with me, uh, I would say it's quite difficult uh, to argue that dialogue has worked. Uh, look at Hungary where it is in 2021, after 10 years or so of dialogue and look at where uh, Poland is uh, with possibly this week, uh, an actual poll exit uh, from the EU uh, uh, legal order when it comes to the rule of law. So this is essentially what uh, many years of dialogue has brought us to. So not a great situation to be in. And that's why I am less optimistic about the EU in 2021 than uh, I was in 2003 uh, when I was in Riga, enjoying the nice uh, sunshine in the summer. Uh, in Riga. I did spend also a, a few weeks in winter. It was not quite the same, but uh, still. I can imagine. I can imagine indeed. What, what my question was, uh, we can expand now the, the perspective. Okay, we are now talking about member states that are non-compliant uh, uh, in the field of rule of law, judicial independence, or just in general, EU values. However, how do you see the importance of dialogue and enforcement vis-a-vis -vis third states, uh, which are very crucial for the European Union's co commerce and diplomacy? Uh, we could mention specific uh, countries, uh, uh, given uh, some recent media coverage, for example, China, 
uh, with the Uyghur camps and the response and the China and EU deals, com uh, commercial deals uh, happening also parallelly to that. So how do you see the, uh, this enforcement and dialogue means uh, importance uh, from EU side vis-a-vis uh, -vis third states? I would, I would say when it comes to uh, third uh, countries, uh, you have to distinguish, I would distinguish between uh, EU candidate countries. So third countries wishing to become EU member states. And then I would say dialogue is not enough. Uh, you really need to make sure that uh, they're going to comply with EU rule of law requirements prior to EU accession. And then you can be more assertive in this particular context uh, from the point of view of the EU. And then uh, third countries with no intention whatsoever uh, to join the EU, uh, for instance, obviously, uh, China or Russia. Uh, so when it comes to uh, candidate countries, uh, the EU framework is actually quite sophisticated and quite demanding. So as you know, I, I mean, you, you wouldn't remember, you're too young, but uh, before uh, Latvia uh, joined the EU, uh, you had to satisfy a number of uh, EU requirements, including you had to show compliance with EU rule of law requirements. This is the enlargement process. Uh, you have to comply uh, with uh, uh, EU values. And this is why, uh, I mean, to oversimplify, for instance, Turkey uh, is yet to join the EU. Uh, now, when it comes to uh, non-EU countries, uh, uh, sorry, non-third um, countries uh, not wishing to join the EU, then I would say dialogue should be, uh, certainly have no objection to dialogue being the default uh, uh, mode of engagement. Uh, however, this doesn't prevent the EU from possibly uh, uh, financing uh, some rule of law projects in third countries, uh, but obviously you need to have the agreement of your partner. So for countries like China or Russia, I would say, uh, yes, the dialogue is fine. Uh, obviously, as long as uh, I'm talking about rule of law matters, I'm not talking about uh, geopolitical matters uh, over which I have no expertise, but when it comes to promoting uh, judicial independence, uh, yes, I would say that obviously that's good. Uh, but then in the context of the Council of Europe, however, possibly I would qualify my answer. Uh, I would say when it comes to members of the Council of Europe, uh, and then you are faced with a, a member of the Council of Europe like Russia, systematically uh, violating uh, the funding principles of the Council of Europe, then I would say dialogue is not enough. Uh, so perhaps I would distinguish here between China and Russia, because Russia is a member of the Council of Europe. And uh, perhaps uh, worth mentioning that the Council of Europe, the statute establishing the Council of Europe, if you look at the values uh, mentioned in the statute, then you see it's exactly almost the same values uh, as we have in Article 2 of the TEU, uh, rule of law, democracy, and respect for human rights. From my point of view, within the Council of Europe framework, when you're dealing with a country like Russia or possibly Turkey, uh, which have been systematically violating uh, fundamental values such as the rule of law, then a dialogue, uh, aka appeasement, uh, should not be the default position. So uh, I would say then again, uh, we're back to what I tend to favor in the situation of systemic violation of the rule of law, enforcement and sanctions. Sadly, uh, there is no way around it. Uh, that would be uh, how I would answer uh, you. Uh, apparently simple question about third countries, but in fact, uh, you have, uh, I think uh, it's helpful to distinguish between different types of uh, non-EU countries. Um, I personally believe that when you face uh, certain difficulties in life, you uh, become stronger afterwards. Um, but currently when I look at the EU, uh, I, I don't know that much of a history, but looking at the you know, chain of events that started since uh, the Brexit, it seems uh, that the stabilization process afterwards is taking pretty much time. And now the events that occurred was one by one, and now with Poland and Hungary, it, it makes me feel that um, something is going wrong. What, what would you say is um, the key factors right now why the situation is the way it is? Uh, uh, another very good uh, but uh, not so easy question to answer. Um, 
so what uh, I mean, my research is mostly about essentially what uh, you could describe. I mean, what I have described as rule of law backsliding. But there is another way of putting it. Uh, um, some political scientists have talked about uh, autocratization. So not a very uh, easy uh, word to say. So essentially, the, this is the same idea, the process, the deliberate process of dismantling checks and balances uh, with the view of cre recreating or creating a de facto uh, one-party uh, structure. So this is what's happening not only in the EU, but elsewhere. Uh, or populism, uh, just to mention another uh, a trend. This is not simply happening in the EU. This is happening uh, everywhere. Think of Trump, think of Brexit. So the world in 2021 is just a, a more difficult place, arguably, than what it was in the 1990s after the fall of the Berlin Wall, where there was a sense of optimism, a sense that democracy was about to prevail and have no challenge whatsoever, or liberal democracy, should I say. Now, uh, in the EU in 2021, we are facing a very difficult situation. Uh, let me put it that way, in the world, uh, there was a ranking of the world's top 10 autocratizing countries. So in the world, I'm talking about. And you know who are the number one and number two in this top 10 of all the uh, world's countries. Poland is number one and Hungary is number two. In the past 10 years, the two countries which have autocratized the most in the world are two EU member states. And then we have in the top five, if I remember well, Serbia and Turkey. Uh, which are uh, two EU candidate countries. So that shows, if anything, uh, the failure of the EU uh, to defend and protect and enforce uh, compliance with its own foundational uh, values. Uh, so um, yes, we are in a difficult uh, place. This is unexpected and this is why I'm afraid, uh, uh, yes, uh, we don't quite know what's gonna happen next. Um, some people have been suggesting the possible disintegration of the EU legal order. Uh, I think this process is ongoing, uh, but this is happening on a slow motion basis. Um, uh, a senior Dutch judge actually uh, in uh, an article I read uh, today was talking about uh, not so visible threats to the foundation of the EU legal system, uh, making an analogy with an how with the, a typical house. When the foundations of a house underground are attacked, you don't see anything uh, above ground. And then one day the house is just gonna crumble. This is a good analogy for what's happening to the EU legal order. You don't, if you look on its face, the EU legal order seems to be functioning, you know, I mean, uh, with one exception, uh, mostly uh, I would say most people by, by large agree that we need the rule of law in the EU, that uh, we need to have an independent court overseeing the application of EU law. But then uh, invisibly, I mean, to a large extent, what is happening in Poland is uh, rotting away the foundations of the EU legal order. And uh, this, uh, what's happening in Poland is also spreading uh, to other countries and surprisingly enough, uh, possibly, uh, Polish authorities have inspired the uh, Hungarian authorities when it comes to attacking judicial independence. Uh, uh, judicial independence was never so frontally attacked in Hungary under Orban as it has been in Poland. Uh, Poland was also an inspiration for Romanian authorities uh, before the change of government uh, last year, where there was also a deliberate process of rule of law backsliding being engaged. Uh, so yes, uh, we can have some concerns about uh, the future of the EU legal order. Uh, I've, however, uh, I don't expect any EU member state to follow the example of the UK, but it could be in fact more per pernicious. What you could have is member states just uh, applying EU law, only the bits and pieces they like, uh, but not necessarily the democracy and uh, rule of law obligations. But this is not what we sign up for. I mean, uh, I wouldn't want to be part of an EU. Uh, I wouldn't, I mean, I'm a new citizen myself, by the way, even though I'm based in London. Uh, but as an EU citizen, I would say uh, I only sign up for a, a union of democracies based on the rule of law. I wouldn't want uh, my tax to be contributing to a union of democracies and autocracies. Uh, if so, I would say I would be against uh, French membership of the EU and being a French national. For me, uh, the EU is only worth supporting if the EU is faithful and enforce uh, compliance with its foundational values, which are actually the same as I was saying, the foundational values of the Council of Europe.
So, as we can still see from your research, you're quite optimistic and you see that there are there is a way out in a sense. Uh, what we are seeing today in Europe, some mechanisms, some communication, some policy. So uh, you have researched how to reconcile the functions of the EU with its citizens. What from your experience are the greatest barriers to effective policy and communication uh, with uh, EU's 445 million pop, uh, million people? So I think perhaps there is something, some solution uh, visible, so how to reconcile really the uh, differences uh, visible today. Uh, it's interesting that you have described me as optimistic. I'm not sure if I would describe myself as optimistic. Um, possibly, I'm, I mean, I'm not sure I'm optimistic, but uh, 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 rather, I would, I would describe myself as um, uh, a strong believer in the foundational values of the EU. I think, for instance, the rule of law is certainly uh, good in the public interest, so worth defending, worth fighting for. So this is possibly why I keep fighting for the rule of law and judicial independence and support to the best I can um, judges or lawyers uh, which are subject or targeted by autocratic authorities. Uh, uh, in addition to writing about the rule of law, I also try to help rule of law defenders. And now when it comes to uh, reconciling uh, Europe with its, um, uh, you know, uh, with its citizens, this, you were alluding to a research project I'm, I'm a member of, which is called uh, Reconnect. So thank you for mentioning this uh, EU-funded uh, project. Uh, so the project is about essentially uh, trying to see uh, the gaps uh, uh, in the current system when it comes to democracy and the rule of law and including a possible communication gap. Um, now, when it comes to the rule of law, quite interestingly, uh, there is a strong support for uh, uh, the rule of law across EU member states. Um, and then uh, this is true across all EU member states. So there is, I would say, a majority of 80, between 80 and 90% in each member state in favor of the rule of law when you tell them essentially uh, what are the core principles of the rule of law. However, people say also that they are not, uh, they don't get enough information about the rule of law. Uh, but then uh, who is supposed to provide information about the rule of law or democracy? So uh, here I would say possibly the EU is being criticized unfairly uh, I would say it's for each uh, member state and they have control over education. So it's really for each member state to uh, more effectively promote uh, democracy, the rule of law, respect for human rights. These are also national principles. They're not simply EU principles, but also national principles. Uh, as regards uh, what we're going to propose uh, to fill or address this gap, then you're gonna have to wait one more year because our project does not conclude until uh, May uh, 2022. Uh, but it's quite interesting to note that even in countries where the rule of law is being attacked, uh, EU membership is still uh, very high in the polls. Uh, 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 I would say between 80 and 90 percent, for instance, in Poland are in favor of EU membership and the same in favor of the core principles of the rule of law. Uh, so the issue is not really the support for the rule of law. The key issue is those undermining uh, the rule of law. And then this is where the EU must do something about it. I have been wondering, um, you have also talked about uh, this unambiguous uh, leadership, uh, political leadership. And I wanted to know how do you uh, imagine that being applied? Because we know that uh, EU member states, sorry, uh, okay. EU member states uh, have um, sovereignty, they have their rights. And uh, if I understand correctly, uh, how do you, do you say that uh, EU can get involved uh, within the processes where the democracy is not well functioning or the autocracy is taking a uh, hand over? Or how, how do you resolve such issues when EU states are not uh, serving democratic uh, values or EU fundamental values? Um, yes, thank you. And sorry if you hear thunderstorms here, uh, but uh, there is a big uh, storm outside my window. Uh, but no worries. 
uh, I'm not sure if you can hear the the rainfalls. Yeah, it's quite uh, quite intense. It's quite relaxing in some sense. <laughs> Um, so, so yes, so essentially the short answer to your question is yes, uh, this is exactly why the EU was set up. In fact, the uh, same for the Council of Europe, the Council of Europe and the EU, perhaps to a lesser extent, uh, because initially the EU's focus was uh, on economic matters, but both the Council of Europe and uh, the EU institutions uh, are supposed to defend uh, the rule of law, democracy and respect for human rights. Uh, as far as the EU is concerned, um, uh, if you read uh, the uh, European uh, Union treaties, it's quite clear that uh, you want to be a member of the club, you have to comply with the club's rules. And uh, one of the rules is to comply with the fundamental values on which the club has been organized. So this is not about national sovereignty. Uh, this is about complying with rules you have uh, committed yourself to complying with. When you join the EU, you sign up to an accession treaty. You don't like it, uh, then you can leave, uh, but it doesn't mean uh, that you have a right to undermine the foundational values of the EU by the mere fact that you are a member of the club. This is not how it works. You join the EU on the basis of uh, accepting uh, a number of uh, quasi-contractual arrangements, even though we're talking about international treaties here. Uh, you cannot then argue uh, 20 years later or 30 years later, sorry, no, uh, we no longer agree with the foundational values on which the EU is based. Uh, but we want to uh, still uh, stay in the club so that we can uh, profit from the benefits of EU membership. So that's just not acceptable. My question is, uh, my question is then regarding more generally, sorry, some echo. We're having technical problems a bit here. Okay, no worries. And not anymore. My question uh, regarding that then is, um, would you say that r more generally, if we see where the world is going now, uh, bigger countries, more centralized systems, more federalism, China is emerging as a big player, would you, see, would you say that Europe will need to, in a sense, reconsider what of the rule of law norms uh, should be kept and what perhaps some of them might see some kind of a reform uh, given the forces, the geoeconomic and geopolitical forces happening in the world. Yes, I mean, it's a difficult question. I'll be uh, reluctant to answer it, if only because I cannot claim any kind of a, a scholarly expertise over the topic, if you don't mind. That's, that's okay, that's okay. But uh, but yeah, I would I I just think it's uh, interesting to to see how uh, certain rule of law norms are being interpreted in in in, in certain member states. Uh, some of them, you know, going to this kind of a rule of law system, and some of them going more to a rule by law system, which we can see. So so yes, this is how uh, what I have been interested in for some time. Um, so yes, uh, rule by law, essentially, that's quite, I mean, uh, to uh, put it uh, provocatively, uh, if you don't mind me saying, rule by law is kind of the uh, Soviet uh, understanding of the rule of law. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this is not compatible with EU membership. If, if that is what you want to do, uh, that's fine. Uh, but then uh, uh, you would have to leave uh, the EU and then you would have also to leave the Council of Europe, I'm afraid. Rule by law is simply not an acceptable uh, uh, approach uh, uh, to uh, remain a member of the club, uh, either the EU or the Council of Europe. Uh, this has not been acceptable uh, since the end of World War II, uh, at least uh, as far as Western Europe is concerned. Uh, because we had rule of, uh, we had rule of uh, rule by law before, and then uh, we saw what happened. So we try to learn from uh, the pre-World War II mistakes and establish uh, counter-majoritarian institutions, including at the supranational levels. What do we have independent courts? Uh, you know? What do we have uh, Constitution 80, constitutional review of legislation? It's all because uh, we saw uh, what happens uh, when uh, you don't have any kind of a procedural or substantive constraints on the executive and legislative branches of government. This is why we have set up plenty of independent um, what, have you heard the concept of counter-majoritarian institutions? So essentially institutions dedicated to constrain the majority of the day to avoid the rule of law or uh, respect for human rights, especially of minorities being violated. 
This is why we have independent, uh, unelected bodies to make sure that elected bodies at the national level simply do not get out of control. Uh, especially, uh, this is why we have a constitutional review of legislation. They have to, you have to comply with the basic uh, democratic rules of the game. And uh, this is what uh, we have learned, I would say, uh, after World War II. The saying, the saying is, the principle is that the, the person who is drafting the rules uh, can uh, find themselves in the minority. So that it indeed is why the principle is there. Yes. Uh, it's very important that you don't interfere with uh, the ecosystem which makes a democracy possible. For instance, it's just not acceptable for the majority of the day to rewrite electoral rules. I mean, this is certainly a fundamental breach of the democratic contract. And yet, this is what happened in Hungary, for instance, where elections are no longer uh, fair because the electoral framework has been completely redesigned with the view of making a rotation of power virtually impossible. Or at least uh, variant, I mean, uh, opposition parties have to fight uh, on, a, on what is no longer a level playing field. Taking into consideration what is going on right now, what would be your prediction how EU looks in five to ten years? Of course, it's hard to predict because no one predicted that something like this is going to happen uh, ten years ago, but. Um, if you have to analyze from this point of view, from right now. Uh, I mean, uh, I have a good uh, prediction uh, uh, record uh, to the extent that uh, when we had the Brexit referendum, I predicted the result uh, with some of my colleagues uh, six months ahead. So then uh, he entitled me to plenty of uh, free drinks. I also predicted uh, the activation of... Our yes, thank you. I also predicted the activation of Article 7 uh, many months uh, before it happened. In the case of Hungary, uh, which entitled me to a nice uh, dinner with a professor at the European uh, uh, University Institute in Firenze, whose name I'm not going to mention because I mean it's bad enough that he lost, but uh, I don't need to rub his nose in it. Um, and however, these were kind of a six month uh, predictions. Uh, you asking me five to ten years? Uh, very difficult. Then maybe, so, maybe, but maybe then predict uh, in a time frame which is, you know, lucky and uh, for you. So maybe what do you see going to happen in a half a year or a year? This is uh, my prediction for next winter uh, on the rule of law front. The situation is about to get much, much worse uh, than it is now. So it's going to get worse before it gets better is my prediction for the next uh, six to 12 months. Uh, we are close to reaching uh, the point of no return uh, as far as Poland is concerned. So we shall see where this is going to lead us to. Uh, but uh, overall, I think uh, the EU is as a crossroad when it comes to the rule of law. And then some uh, other EU member states may have to confront uh, very difficult decisions in the next few months. Uh, to what extent uh, uh, can you support uh, your neighboring countries uh, for diplomatic reasons? Why the neighboring countries stop being democracies based on the rule of law? What is that? You know, what are your red lines? I'm talking about the national governments here from uh, other EU member states um, when it comes to the situation of other EU countries where the rule of law is being dismantled. I'm talking especially about the poll exit uh, this week. Uh, so, uh, long story short, I think uh, the EU is going to face uh, a very difficult winter with very uh, uh, existential questions uh, at the forefront of the debate. So that's the extent of my prediction. I don't want to go further than this. On a, on a more concluding, but not the, the last remark, my question would be, uh, given the situation now in which we find ourselves in and your prediction also, what are, for young professionals uh, in the legal and political spheres, what are some, some, some hard steps that they can do, uh, some really tangible steps that they can do in order to uh, enforce this rule of law and other EU values and just to promote uh, such understanding in general? Um, yeah, um... So I would say, uh, first of all, it's good to be vocal. Uh, so when you see unacceptable things, uh, you have to make your voice heard and you have to lend your public support to those uh, in the eye of the storm. 
So if you see uh, judges, lawyers, academics, or fellow students being attacked uh, for standing for what they view are princip uh, the right principles, uh, if you uh, are a witness to attacks on the rule of law, so it's important to stand up and denounce what you are seeing. And then possibly uh, to join or set up uh, groups uh, whose uh, job is to defend the rule of law. Uh, for instance, you have plenty of initiatives like this in Poland. So uh, my uh, fair dues to those, uh, you know, fighting for the rule of law in the trenches. Uh, you can also join political parties or join NGOs uh, specializing in the defense of uh, human rights, uh, rule of law, democracy. So there is a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of groups I think you could join. Or uh, if you don't uh, like any of the groups existing, then why don't you set up your own group and then uh, a right to uh, authorities, uh, uh, right to MP, right to MEP, and just to make uh, rule of law, for instance. Uh, the key issue, which is always uh, debated uh, until the situation does improve. The worst thing you can do is simply stay silent, stay on the fence, hoping that what's happening to your neighbor is not going to happen to you. This is the worst, uh, the worst behavior you, can, uh, you, could, uh, you could do. Um, so that would be my advice. Don't stay silent and don't remain on the fence. Uh, uh, you have to take a stand and do, you, do the best, even the most uh, modest uh, take or defense uh, can help, you know, someone somewhere. Some say, some say that being silent is the main reason uh, why democr democratic regimes disintegrated in the 1930s, because of the fact that people hope that uh, it's just a limit, it's a really limited incident, it does not happen to me, everything's fine. But indeed, uh, if something is happening to our neighbor, it may at some point also uh, threaten us and our households. So being really vigilant, I think it's important. Yes, I mean, um, I agree. Uh, you know, the, um, uh, the quotation, uh, you know, uh, the only thing necessary for the triumph for evil, uh, uh, you know, is for good men or good women uh, to do nothing, essentially, yeah, just to uh, paraphrase quickly. So I think inaction, uh, yes, silence are the worst things you can uh, do when you are uh, witnessing uh, attacks on uh, rule of law, but also those uh, defending the rule of law. And I'm talking here essentially about... Um, judges, uh, lawyers, prosecutors, but also uh, legal academics and, uh, and law students also uh, quite often uh, take uh, an active uh, role in defending the rule of law. Uh, I'm thinking, for instance, of uh, Turkish stu or students in Turkey uh, or even uh, students in Poland or students in uh, Belarus. Uh, I saw recently uh, a law student, I think, uh, taking... Uh, uh, an amazingly uh, brave stance in public, uh, in defense, I think, of one of her professors. And then uh, she was quickly arrested. But this is the kind of uh, bravery. Uh, I mean, I'm not asking people to be as brave as this uh, young female uh, student from Belarus, uh, but uh, we are more comfortable in the EU. Uh, so there are less risk, actually, at being brave in the EU. Uh, so uh, the least we can do is at least uh, be vocal, if only on Twitter. What uh, it doesn't cost you uh, uh, very much uh, to actually write publicly uh, what's happening to uh, Judge A is a scandal. Uh, this legislation undermining judicial independence is not acceptable. You know, I think that would help. Uh, you need to create some sort of a momentum in the defense of the rule of law, and especially since uh, we are in a relatively uh, comfortable positions uh, being uh, citizens of EU countries where we are fairly protected from autocratic authorities for now. Before we uh, are s slowly approaching the closing remarks, maybe you have something that you would like to say to our listeners or you want to maybe ask uh, to Christopher and I. Um, I'm sorry, not really. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's been a long day, uh, so I'm afraid uh, my brain is uh, slowly uh, shutting down. I understand. I would, I, would, I, I would say that this conversation was very helpful and, and you were on point. So thank you very much. Uh, as I said, uh, I hope uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, nightmare is going to come to an end at some point, and then I'm going to be able uh, to travel to places where I have uh, uh, good memories associated with. 
hope to see you in Riga. <laughs> yes, yes, we have a deal, I think. All right, let's do that. <laughs> thank you, Laurent, really. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. The episode was developed in collaboration with the webinar series Spring with the Rule of Law in Central and Eastern Europe, organized by the SWPS University of Social Sciences and Humanities, as well as the Riga Graduate School of Law.